Most previous Last Supper paintings had shown Jesus at one end of the table and the Apostles at the other, and they all emphasised the gulf between the serenity of Jesus and the flawed disciples, to the extent that this cheeky bastard's asleep. Imagine people saying, Blimey, you were at the Last Supper, what was it like? And having to go, Oh, crashed out. Leonardo portrayed Jesus in the middle, not separate from the mortals. And whereas other Last Suppers tended to emphasise the calm of communion, Leonardo covered the drama of the moment when Jesus announced the betrayal. So the most interesting aspect is the reaction of the disciples. It's probably the first example in history of the technique used by soap operas at the end of an episode where one of the characters says, I found out who my real father is. And the camera dwells on the other characters as they go, <gasps> It's as if Jesus is saying, One of you is going to betray me. Again, it took much longer than planned, probably a total of three years. A prior came to complain, so Leonardo wrote to the head of the monastery, Your Excellency is aware that only the head of Judas remains to be done, and he was an egregious villain. To this end, for about a year, I have been going every day to the area where the ruffians live, but have not been able to discover a villain's face corresponding with what I have in mind. But I may take the features of the prior who came to complain, who would fit the requirements perfectly. When you're actually in this room, there's two things that you notice that you don't really get from looking at the picture on the page. One is just the sense of amazement at actually being next to such an iconic image. And the other is that there's a huge doorway going through the middle of the painting which the monks apparently put there so that they could come through to the refectory more quickly. It's lucky they weren't in charge of the Sistine Chapel really or they'd have thought we could have a skylight put through there. For a while Leonardo dedicated himself to creating a whole new approach to designing towns. On the other hand, he'd been paid to sculpt this bloody horse. He did build a clay model of the design, but then he got distracted again by his scientific studies. He read the original scientific writings of the ancients and he became obsessed with analysing motion, convinced that every movement could be explained mathematically. 150 years before Isaac Newton, he wrote, It is not possible to describe the movement of water unless one defines gravitation. Even more visionary were his theories on sound. 400 years before Marconi, he wrote, Just as the stone thrown into the water becomes the centre and cause of various circles, the sound made in the air spreads out in circles. Leonardo was aware that these ideas were in complete opposition to the ideology of medieval Europe. He went into the mountains to study geology, in particular to collect proof that there had never been a great flood, and he came close to some of the theories used by Darwin 350 years later. He found fossils of cockles 250 miles from the sea, and wondered whether it was possible for a cockle to travel from the sea to this point in 40 days. So he set up an experiment which showed that in flood waters, cockles only travelled 8 feet a day, and he concluded... With such a rate of motion, it would not travel 250 miles during 40 days of the flood. This meant that in the time since the cockles had arrived at this point, the sea must have moved, an idea no one had considered before then. But his most celebrated work concerned his quest to fly. The first crucial jump he made can be seen in phrases like, A substance offers as much resistance to the air as the air to the substance. So his genius here was to work out that air was something and not nothing. Whereas hundreds of years later, we just take it for granted. I was coming back from Barbados, and as we were taking off, the pilot announced, uh, because of a headwind, we will be landing at London Heathrow uh, approximately 15 minutes later than scheduled. And the woman next to me went, oh. And I thought, oh, for God's sake, woman, we're going across an entire ocean. A few hundred years ago, this would have taken six months and resulted in almost certain death. And all you can say is, oh, for God's sake, you'd think they'd be able to do something about the winds. Now I'm going to miss the opening minutes of a touch of frost. For him, 
there was nothing magical about flight, it was just a matter of working out those laws. So he built a pair of wings with strips along each one to perfectly match the nerves of a bird. Then he covered them in feathers and built retractable flaps for takeoff and landing, just like on a modern plane. And when you look at the reconstruction of this design, you realise the difference between a genius and a non-genius. Because only a genius could have come up with that. But it takes a non-genius to go, we're well, not going to be able to fly anywhere in that, you bloody idiot. In his notebooks he wrote, From Mount Chechere, the famous bird will take flight, which will fill the world with its great renown. Though according to an unconfirmed rumour, his pupil Zoroastro tried it, but broke his leg.